Hello, I'm Keith. And I'm Matt. And in this one, we're talking about how to sell handmade items online and the experiences that we've had over the years. Hope you enjoy the podcast. So online then, Matt, what experiences have you had selling online? Well, I started many years ago with what was the biggest thing at the time, which was Etsy. And I sold a few bits, nothing major, but I thought I'd try something else, which was folksy, which is like Etsy, but it's a UK-based one. Now, I think both of them had similar business models, as in there was a listing fee and the charge commission on each sales. Even if you're not selling anything, you're still getting charged for the listing fee each month or however long it was. I actually had more luck on Folksy, which was just UK-based, because actually I was only ever going to ship things domestically. And because, I don't want to be too stereotypical, but it tends to be a lot of women who do it, so there's a lot more feminine oriented products. So every time it was Father's Day or Christmas or something, they would do gift guides and they would do gift guides for her, gift guides for a teenager, gift guides for him. And in the him bit, they would always list a few of my products ah. because they're reclaimed wood with beer bottles in. So that was really helpful. But at the time, I was one of the very few woodworkers that did gifts that I mean, I'd never designed anything thinking this is a, a male gift, this is a female gift, but the editors clearly thought that will work in that category. So that was, I guess I'd found a niche on that website and that was quite helpful. But then I tried Amazon Handmade, which is Amazon's version of Folksy or Etsy. But before we get onto that, I know you were on Etsy, so maybe did you have more luck? Um... Yes, but I wouldn't say I loved Etsy as a platform. Um, so I thought I'd pull up my Etsy page and go through some statistics. Um, since being on Etsy, I've had 255,000 page views, 130,000 visits to my store and 848 orders. And I've made 14.7k in revenue Hello, it's Keith here, just interrupting while I'm editing this podcast, just to clarify that this was over the course of about five and a half years. I really should have said that. Anyway, back to the podcast. And I still sell on Etsy to this day. However, I think pretty much 90% of the success I've had with Etsy has been via my YouTube channel. And I think the problem with Etsy is that they don't really do a great job at promoting your listings. And I also think that for the fees that you're paying Etsy, they should be really doing a better job at putting your items out there and getting it in front of people that are shopping online. Um, so it kind of works for me being a YouTuber, but I don't know if I would want to sign up to Etsy if I wasn't on YouTube. I also did some analysis of sales over the course of a year. And in this particular year, I made £4,556 in sales, so that's turnover. And of that, £711 went on postage costs, which is about 16%. And a further £401, which is 9%, went on Etsy fees. So the profit was actually £3,444, which is basically 75% of that turnover. And then you've got material costs... Yes. On top of that. Yeah, so the, the items that I sell on Etsy, originally I was basically just selling items that I've made, um, but I soon learned that that wasn't really doing so well. I've probably still got a few handmade items on my Etsy shop, but it's certainly not where I've had the most success with sales. Again, being a YouTuber, I've had more success at selling merchandise and stuff that I make on there for people who do woodworking. So, for example, my oil wax finish is definitely the item that I sell the most of on Etsy. I also sell some plans for items that I've made so that other people can make the same things. And they're pretty good because it's pretty much passive income once you've done the plans and once you've put together all of the information. That might take you half a day, but once that's done, it'll carry on um, making money into the future. But yeah, taking the oil wax finish as an example... I sell them for, I think it's £14.85 for a single pot of wax. 
The total costs in that pot of wax is about £6.35, which is made up of £3 of postage and then £3.35 of ingredients, tin and labelling. So from each pot I make £8.50. It probably takes me about an hour of my time to make 12 pots. So if you do the maths on that, it's £8.50 times 12, which is £102. And that seems pretty good for an hour's work. But then obviously you've got to factor in the time it takes to package each item when the sale comes through, the time it takes to go to the post office to send that item out, and everything that goes along with it. Um, even the cost of the electricity to make it, I guess, is is something that you could factor in. Yeah. I'm not an expert at pricing things at all, but to me, it kind of justifies carrying on selling it. It's not, a, I wouldn't call it a big money spinner, but it's um, it's decent enough for my liking. But it shows you how hard it is to make a living. I mean, you're a YouTuber with nearly 200,000 subs, and you are not driving enough traffic to Etsy to anywhere near even make minimum wage on. Exactly. And, but that's the one thing Etsy offers, I guess, is you're saying it's not good for people discovering you, but at least they can. If you just set up your own website, no one would find your website without driving traffic to it. Mm. But as you're a YouTuber and you're driving all the traffic to Etsy, you could be driving the traffic to your own website and not paying any commission. It's just um, the time and effort is to set all that up. If you're looking for a cat bed... You could go to Etsy and type in cat bed and find you. But the trouble is you could be on page 16 because there's so many. And because it's international as well, I, it, you, I think you can select UK only, but it's, it's not obvious how to do it. So you can get lost and you find this cat bed you love and actually that's been made in Taiwan or Spain. or And then the shipping costs are ridiculous and you kind of feel, oh, I'm just wasting my time looking at all this stuff that I'm never going to buy because it's logistically not possible yeah international shipping is a funny one with etsy as well because i've everything that i've listed i've made available across the world um kind of highly expecting only uk sales to come in but i've had a lot of sales from places like usa and canada um where they've paid more in shipping than the actual cost of the item which astounds me but yeah my advice for anyone wanting to join our Etsy is definitely click on the worldwide shipping. Uh, there's a lot of hassle that goes with it. You might have to fill in customs documentation and make yourself familiar with what countries allow certain products in and out. Um, I seem to remember I had to send a coffee table to Australia once. There was something about importing timber in their rules that sounded dubious, but... I ended up just sending it anyway and hoping for the best and it got there okay. So that's the main thing. Yeah, things have got increasingly complicated with customs declarations to Europe, even to Northern Ireland now. And it's very hard to find the information you need on how to fill these things out. It is. It's a steep learning curve. But the other thing I'd say is with larger items. um, So I've listed several coffee tables on um, Etsy. Being a YouTube woodworker, obviously I make a lot of coffee tables and any that haven't had a use either for myself or family and friends have ended up on Etsy and I've still got two coffee tables listed on there and they tend to just sit there for months if not years Um, even when you price them really low. The two that I've got on there at the moment are £75 each Um, but yeah, they just sit there for ages, but eventually they do go. So mm. I just kind of leave them sitting there. I'm paying a monthly fee, I think, for them sitting on Etsy. But Sometimes you just have things sat around and you just want them shifted because they're taking up room. Yeah. I've definitely used Facebook Marketplace when I've had prototypes or seconds. And if it's something I would normally sell for £60, I put it on Facebook for 20 quid because... I don't want to list it on my normal place. I just want rid of it. But if I can just get my material costs back. Yeah. Rather than throw it in the fire. Cutting your losses. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I guess the other thing to say about Etsy is if you devote a lot of time to it, you can probably find ways of getting it to promote you. In a similar way to how we work with YouTube, trying to understand what the algorithm likes and what it doesn't like so i think if you set up as an etsy business and you are really devoted to learning how to promote your items on there then you might be able to do well and there are people out there doing really well on etsy definitely but it's not as easy as you might first think 
yeah, I think with these sites, success breeds success. The more sales you have, the more when they promote you, the more reviews you have, the more items you list. I mean, a bit the same with YouTube. Mm. It, the more videos you have and the more you post and the more views, the more they promote you. So, yeah, you've got to put so much effort in. But the trouble with me and you is we've got our fingers in a lot of pies. So it's hard to put so much time into just doing that one thing. So do you still use Folksy? Do you still have items on there? No, I deleted everything when I moved house just because I didn't want to be moving with stock. So I cleared out all my stock on Facebook Marketplace. As I said, it's good for getting rid of... You've got to put them almost cost price just to get rid of them, but I did. It's very different uh, to being a, a YouTube woodworker making one item a week to... I want to make a batch of 30 items. You need such a different selection of tools. You really need almost getting into industrial machinery. You need to be able to process that much, especially rough sawn wood. In theory, I could make everything with hand tools now, but I needed a big plane of thickness and a dust extractor in a workshop. And I couldn't be doing that in my living room. So I just, I knew with the move that I would not be able to continue that. Yeah, and that, that kind of economies of scale thing where you just make things in bulk and you know make 15 of something at a time and list them on etsy is definitely the way to do it yeah and you get better at it you've got to do all the cuts you need with the ripping blade on the table saw at once yeah even if one bit is for part one and one part is for part 17 and then swap out your cross cut saw blade and sled and cut all those parts and you get very good at doing it because the quicker you can do it the more profit there is and that not saying you're rushing it you're just working more efficiently and maybe if you're planing all the wood you're planing it for three different items rather than just doing it for the one i'm sure for things like your wax I bet you've got better and better and more efficient at making it each time. I have, yeah. I now use a slow cooker to do it. I literally just put all of the ingredients in a slow cooker, turn it on, wait a couple of hours, go back to it, put it all in tins, slap some labels on, and then there's 12 pots of wax ready to go. And there's similar comparisons with how I do YouTube now as well. So, for example, I'm scripting two different videos at the moment, and then I'll go and film them both. And there's time savings just in doing two at a time. Whereas if I scripted a video, went and filmed it, scripted a video, went and filmed it, that would take so much more time because I would need to sort my hair out, uh, find the right <laughs> camera lens, set up the lighting and all of that stuff. It's It makes sense just to do things in bulk, doesn't it? It's more time efficient. So I'm going to have to really pay attention to what you're wearing in videos and see the <laughs> two that were clearly filmed at the same time now. <laughs> So what about eBay then, Matt? Have you had good or bad experiences listing things there? I listed things, uh, things I made, but I don't think I'd ever sold anything. And as I say, all I can think is that people want a bargain. I listed tools before Facebook Marketplace was a thing, but the commission is huge on eBay. Pretty much 10%, usually. And they're very bad at kind of telling you what the fees would be but there's a lot of money isn't it to take off as when you can do it on facebook there's no fees whatsoever so and i, I notice that now when i look at tools on ebay there's so fewer for sale because why does anyone want to sell anything when it costs you money when there's this free alternative so it's kind of killed ebay as a resource for old tools yeah, I agree. Um, I think with eBay, though, what you're paying for is getting it in front of so many people's eyes. Um, and I think eBay probably is still the place where you can get it in front of the most amount of people. Because I feel like places like Gumtree, the other kind of alternatives, don't really have that scale. I agree with used items, craft items you've made. Facebook is bigger. Yeah, I don't think um, for items you've made, eBay is really the right place. Um, I have done it, though. Um, in fact, that doghouse that I mentioned I made earlier, at the time, again, I didn't really have any confidence to go into sales mode and try and get it sold. So I listed it on eBay, and it went went within several days. But that is the trouble with it. eBay. If you're selling something big, then you weren't going to ship a, a dog bed because putting on a pallet would have cost more than the dog bed yeah and so it's not always the best for trying to find things locally that, that's why i think it's good for me when i'm selling machinery to put it on facebook because if someone's got to drive in a van 
then you want them to be 10 miles up the road as I'd get messages on uh, eBay and they'd be hours away and ask me if I'd pallet it up and like no it's just not it's, I don't have a, a pallet truck or a forklift I can't be moving things from the garage down to the road and it's just no not going to happen yeah So Amazon Handmade, a few years ago, they released it and I saw it as an alternative to Etsy. I mean, Amazon, these big companies do it with everything. As soon as they see something that they can rip off and make some money on, they do. But because it was a new thing, they weren't charging listing fees. So you could list as many items as you want and only paid a commission if you sold something. So that was quite appealing. It was definitely more complicated to sign up to than the other ones. And the listing pages had four different tabs with different pages with options and things. But quite intimidating at first, but then I got good at it. But Amazon is obviously the world's biggest retailer. So if you've got your products on that, you're getting to the most eyes. So yeah, I was doing the gin racks. I was getting to the top of the page as Amazon recommended because I'd sold so many and had so many reviews. So it was all going well. And then uh, I had someone kind of rip me off a few years ago and like it, almost identical design and even identical photograph as I had mine mounted to a bare brick wall and they even copied that oh. and they just knocked a few quid off the price and my sales almost dropped overnight. So I had to reduce my price. I think they they, they gave up then because... I had the more reviews and things. So it's, it's tricky, isn't it? Especially when you're a small business, you don't want to just copy someone else's idea. It's hard to come up with something original. And I'm, I'm sure my idea wasn't original. But then with anything that is reasonably successful, people are going to copy it and uh, others came along and sales dropped off. And it's a shame other sites that kind of vet you to make sure it is handmade... I think Amazon did that, actually. They wanted a photograph of your workshop and yourself and things like that. And you have a little bio about you. But in the tabs on Amazon, you can go into Handmade and search products. Or you can find the Handmade products just through the normal search. So if you typed in Gin Rack, it would come up with mine and this mass-produced one. And there was no real distinction to know that one was made by a guy in his shed reasonably locally to you or mass-produced somewhere else. They didn't do a very, very good job of that. Dealing with big companies hard. I bought myself an iPad a few months ago. I opened the box. It t- came at 10 at night. So I didn't spend much time with the driver. I literally opened the door in the winter at 10 at night and grabbed the box and closed the door. And I had received some fake nails. No way. Yep. You were scammed. I spoke to another d- delivery driver and they go, yeah, it's happening a lot. The people are seeing the orders for the iPad nicking it and putting something else in the box. Oh, man. Because they're worth a lot of money. But it took me nearly a month to get my money back with filling in forms and investigations and complaints and things. Yet, I would have it that someone would order something. I would always send it a tracked service so it would be delivered. And then if someone complained a month later saying they hadn't had it, even though we'd communicated and they'd said they'd had it, Amazon wouldn't even look into it. They'd just automatically refund that person that second. Yeah. And so it was very annoying that there was no kind of dispute process. They just took the purchase aside and they got their money back. And really, they got the item for free. Mm. And uh, and I couldn't make a claim with the delivery company because it had been delivered. So that happened a few times. And I think as soon as people know that they can do that, it was just going to happen more and more. When you're a small business and every sale counts and then you lose things like that it's very demoralizing so i'm quite pleased not to have to deal with all that again Mm. posting packaging is a huge thing which you don't really consider but waiting in for couriers to come and pick things up or taking things to post office is a huge amount of your time yeah i mean i tend to do three post office runs a week just through the oil wax sales basically and where i used to live i had a post office on my road so it was literally a two minute walk down the road and the items were gone but now obviously i'm in a village so 
I need to drive to the post office. So yeah, it's a bit of a pain and it does take time out of your day. And I think eventually it might get to a point where I might need to look at some sort of fulfillment service similar to what Peter is doing with his jigs. But for the time being, I actually quite enjoy packaging up items and uh, and taking them to the post office because it's a it's a reason to kind of break up the day and it's and break up activities and just do something different and i quite like the monotony of wrapping things as well i got into using the new royal mail collect service oh yeah i think they were charging i can't remember if it was 30p or 60p an item and they'd only do five items a day but they'd even come and collect a letter if you wanted i don't know why you'd want to do that yeah. But obviously, as soon as they've collected, you get an email confirming it's in the system. So it's better than just dropping it in a post box because obviously there's no acknowledgement that you've ever sent it. But yeah, I, what I used to do in the old house is I would put the things in the garage, close the garage door, go to the workshop, get on work. They'd come, open the garage. I'd designate the garage as a safe space, pick the things up, scan them, take them away. And that worked really well for me. The postage and shipping fees as well. With my total Etsy turnover, 16% of that is just going on postage fees. Plus the packaging. And we moaned about material prices, but it's the same for the packaging. I used to use this um, EcoFill, which is the like the packing peanuts that are made from plant base, and you can dissolve them in the sink or um, put them on the compost. But I think I was paying eighteen pounds a bag a few years ago, and now they're twenty six pounds a bag, and it's it all adds to your cost and the boxes and the tape and all the courier service have gone up in price and. Sometimes you look at the item you're trying to sell and because there's competitors, you can't put the item up in price. It's just all eating into your profit margins. Yeah, I only use recycled um, materials for packaging. I always have done. But then again, I've got the luxury of having a storeroom in my house where I can store stuff like that. I've got loads of flat packed boxes in there, bubble wrap. The amount of this stuff that you get through the door with every Amazon package, you know, it's... um, there's enough there to keep you going for a long while. But it, that certainly adds time into the packaging process because it, everything needs to be, you know, adjusted. I need to cut my boxes to fit the item that I'm sending. Um, it would certainly make more sense for me to just buy in materials. But as I say, I quite enjoy that aspect of uh, of wrapping things up. So for me, it's no hardship, really. That wasn't an option for me because at some points I was selling, I don't know, 20 gin racks a week. Mm. so there was no I had to buy the boxes and the loose fill packaging because under my spare bed at the moment there's bin bags full of brown paper and all the packaging I save it I imagine going to stop doing because I I haven't sent anything in months I don't know why I keep saving it but it's just uh, old habits die hard but yeah I had no choice I needed uh, a regular supply of stuff because I was not buying enough online to be able to reuse enough packaging I'm glad I got out of it when I did actually I think yeah, prices have probably gone up even more because fuel costs and driver shortages have just driven up careers even more, I imagine. Another thing to mention, actually, have you got a label printer? No, I've always wanted one. What I've got is just a normal A4 printer that has sheets that go through it with them sticky back labels. Yeah. But it wastes half the sheet, I guess, but they're extremely cheap. But have you, you've got a proper label printer, have you? Yeah, I did a video called A Day in the Life, which was just me doing stuff during the course of the day that I put out for my Patreon viewers just as an exclusive video. And I got a comment on that from Carl at Straw Bite Workshop um, asking, you know, what the hell are you doing? Get yourself a label printer. And I thought, I don't need a label printer. And then I got one and it's like, oh, my God, that saves so much time (laughs) because you just hit print. It comes out as a perfect label. You slap it on the parcel and you're done. And it's a thermal printer as well. So it prints so quickly. Um, That saves so much time. Uh, So thank you, Carl, if you're listening. (laughs) Yeah, he sends out a lot of uh, things. And I imagine it's all small parcels for him because I remember the post office there was a system where you could have like a almost like a credit card thing and put everything in a bag and drop it off and then they'd scan it next time you go in you'd hand over your card and they'd put the information of what they scanned on but I was never at that kind of level of shipping to justify that and I think you can get the Royal Mail to come and collect a sack of things from your house but I think you've got to be spending like 20,000 a year on postage with them for them to do it. Hello, Keith here, just interrupting the podcast to let you know that we now have a Patreon page. We don't earn any money for making this podcast and it takes us quite a lot of time and money to prepare and produce each episode and we'd like to keep putting it out for free. 
If you'd like to help support it, there'll be a link to the page in the show notes, or you can search online for Workshop Banter Patreon. We also want to say a big thank you to everyone who has signed up already. We really appreciate it. There's also the option of having your own website to sell from. Obviously, both of us have got our own websites, but they're not really geared up for sales because personally, I rely on Etsy and places like that as a platform to sell the items that I want to sell. Do you have any merchandise stuff or do you use Teespring? I do have Teespring, not hugely successfully, but I put e-commerce on my Squarespace not sponsored site. It's one of those 1% of podcasts or videos that isn't sponsored by Squarespace. (laughs) If you're listening, we'll have some of your money because I have been using Squarespace for years and years, way before all the adverts, actually. But it's just so easy. As I had a go at WordPress in lockdown, thinking I'd have time, but the amount of work to do it and then the updates, there's constantly bits that need updating as when you have something like Squarespace other platforms are available it all just gets done for you behind the scenes rather than it was almost a daily basis something needed doing and all the security concerns and you can see the logs of all the times people have tried to hack you and it's just terrifying like oh squarespace just handles all this for me and i never need to know about it but also the costs i can't remember what squarespace costs like 10 pounds a month say but hosting it doing it yourself was not much different in price in fact it might have even cost more money yet i was doing all the work so i cancelled squarespace did it all myself and then i actually got busy with work and realized i can't be spending this much time on just maintaining a website i need someone else just to take this off my plate and went back to squarespace yeah so it was a bit of a learning curve but i think it's a thing about being self-employed and running your own business you're the accountant, you're the marketing person, you're the social media person, you're... The web designer. Web designer. And sometimes you go, I just can't do it. I can't do everything. So does Squarespace have its own mechanism for sales? Are you able to sell items on your website through Squarespace? Yep. And I assume there's an additional cost for that. There's different subscription models, as in you can have your basic package, which is just a website, and you can add e-commerce. I think I mean one that they charge, I don't know, I'm totally making this up, so um, it might not be true, but they charge a small transaction fee or commission per item. But if I was to upgrade to the next level, then they wouldn't charge anything. Right. Um, But I'd be paying more for the website each month. But that could easily be worth it if I was selling much. But at the moment, I'm I'm not selling much. So, But it's very slick. Um, Payment through PayPal and uh, email, like the managing as soon as... I've got it. I think I've got it linked to Royal Mail. So as soon as I like print the label, it marks it as shipped. So it all works very smoothly. Oh, right. But I don't think anyone Googling notepads would ever come across my website. But obviously, people that click a link under my video, it doesn't really matter where the link goes to. If it goes to Amazon or Folksy or Etsy or eBay or my own website. So it might as well be my own website. And I make more money per transaction and i guess the same is true with if people are finding you i guess increasingly more on social media if you're selling things people are finding you from facebook or from instagram then you could be driving people to your own website as back when i first started years and years ago if i just created my own website and put things for sale no one's ever going to find it yeah it's just going to get lost Um, search engine optimization is quite a tricky skill and really all the bigger search engines want you to pay for getting ranked to higher i think so i don't know how anyone would ever find you really unless you had a very unique product and you were the only search result for that but you're thinking of redoing your site i believe yeah so my brother currently does my website for me but he's not a web designer he just kind of knows a few things um but it's not set up for sales or anything like that. And to be honest, I don't really want the hassle of setting it up for sales. I I need to completely rework my website anyway. And it's not really something I can give any insight on because I just don't know enough about this stuff. So, yeah, I'm going to refrain from commenting on the web side of things. Yeah, I don't know anything at all. But I think it's really important to have a website, even if it's a basic one. There's the amount of businesses that don't have websites still I find amazing. Or you look up a business and all they have is a Facebook page and you just can't find... They don't update it and it's. I think it's just unprofessional. As soon as a place, especially 
pubs seem to be terrible for it. They don't have websites. Yeah. You just need to know the opening times and a menu and some basic things. Yeah, and it doesn't need to be anything complicated, really. Just a landing page with, you know, telephone number, address, that sort of basic information. Is there anything else that we haven't covered? We went through that quickly, considering Etsy and Amazon are the two we've actually had the most success with. Yeah. I think we've been quite negative. (laughs) Um, I didn't realise how many bad experiences I'd had, and you've clearly had too, and how difficult a journey it's been finding something that will work. And until you say it out loud, you don't realise it. So I don't want to put people off, but it's... uh, it's been a struggle to find something that's worked, hasn't it? Definitely, yeah. And neither of us had actually had huge success. I mean, I had a couple of very successful seasons, but it's so... It changes all of the time, doesn't it? Things things change with technology and everything. Yeah, and just like Christmas. You'll have a, a Christmas where you do £2,000 worth of sales, and January you do £50. It's very hard to run a business like that. It's, yeah. That's why it's... It's kind of worked, I think, for what we've done is we've had YouTube and maybe part-time jobs and done this. Yeah. And you've done a few kitchen worktops and it's diversifying into different things. Yeah. But actually, I find it quite nice to have gone, oh, I'm not going to make another Blooming Mud kitchen and I'm not going to be posting things. I'm just going to concentrate on this one thing is quite nice. But then scary that if this one thing doesn't work out, I've given up on all the other things. Yeah, it's so important just to try different things and uh, experiment with things. And eventually you'll probably find something that works, but it might not work forever. So not the most positive of podcasts, but hopefully there's some useful stuff in there. People used to think there was a job for life. I think now people retrain a huge amount of times during their life. So yeah, nothing's going to last forever but yeah you've got to keep trying and moving with the technology and trends um you're saying your friend doing the scaffold board things and i was doing a lot of rustic palette things to start with all hugely popular but what's going to be the next thing i imagine that kind of rustic furniture thing must be coming to an end i've been thinking that for years but there still seems to be popular but you, yeah, you see it now. I imagine you could go on to Argos or other big retailers and see fake pallet furniture. Yeah. In fact, even like DIY stores sell furniture panels that look like pallet wood, some of them, mm. things like that now. So as soon as it's become that kind of mainstream, you kind of feel that's close to the end. But who knows what's next? What do you think the next trend? That'd be good as well. What do we need to get into? I don't know anything about trends. I mean, you can just see from the way that I dress. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen those sh- yellow shorts. <laughs> I mean, I've always really loved mid-century modern furniture, as you know, but and recently that has had a resurgence in yeah. popularity. Um, and also, I was, I was looking at an article yesterday about the colours that are going to be in for the next year, and green is, <laughs> is the in colour, forest green. Oh, really? Everyone's going to be painting their room forest green, just as I did that a few months back. (laughs) Trendsetter. (laughs) I decorated my guest room as my first room, and I painted one wall, and I think it genuinely was called forest green. There we go. We're we're ahead of the times. (laughs) Ahead, Ahead of the times, yeah. So what have you been watching, Matt, on YouTube? Uh, Scott Walsh uh, and a video, he's got a lot of good videos, but it's how to buy used tools. Now, I think he's Canadian, so he's talking about 15 amp motors and things like that that don't apply in the UK, but it's still, the point is the same. And he tells you good uh, tips on what to look for, things to think about before you go, and yeah, it's a good video, and he just he just makes nice videos. How to buy used tools, I found it. I'll check that out. Yeah. Sounds good. I think one of his recent videos was uh, I taught my girlfriend woodworking. So I taught my wife woodworking could be a a video. And you've collaborated in the past, haven't you, actually? Yeah, I've done a couple of projects with her. One where she made some coasters and one where we made a box to hold a bottle of champagne, I think it was. Yeah, it's, it's always good fun. You've been watching anything good? 
Yeah. So this is one that my brother recommended that I watched. Um, and it's called Power Carving a Phoenix Out of a Pine 2x4 by Ross the Random. And the job that he does with this uh, craft project is incredible. And having a look through some of his other projects as well, he does mainly small craft projects. So not necessarily woodworking, but there are a lot of woodworking and a few metalworking videos in there. But the humour that he puts in his videos is is really good. So I'd, I'd recommend checking that channel out. Um, I got many a giggle out of watching that video about the Phoenix. And uh, I'm looking forward to checking out more of his videos. Oh, that sounds good because... I would have thought one of the hardest woods to carve would have been construction timber. Well, it's soft, but the trouble is you've got all of those knots and awkward parts to negotiate. Knots, and it just would splinter out, I feel. Yeah. So, yeah, that must be difficult. He's got some crazy numbers as well I've just seen. He's got a video with 8.8 .8 million views. Whoa. Where he has carved a skull out of a spoon. Yeah, that looks cool as well. Thanks for listening. You can find Matt on YouTube by searching for Badger Workshop and me by searching for Rag and Bone Brown. There's also a Workshop Banter Instagram and Facebook page if you'd like to get in touch, which is at Workshop Banter, all as one word.